So first I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank the wonderful organizers of this event for including me, because it gives me a chance to talk about something that I love, which is innovation hypercycles. Innovation leads to more technology, you all know that. Some see benefits in this, I certainly do. Others see dangers, and those are quite reasonable to think about. Animals other than us occasionally do innovate as well, but they don't progress. They reinvent the proverbial wheel again and again. Human innovation, by contrast, has shown progress in the course of human history. It generally has risen in a relatively smooth trend line. But occasionally this trend line is broken and innovation rockets upwards, temporarily and in particular places. I call these innovation hypercycles and they lead to hot spots of technology. So why would I show a fish, a heron, an algae, and a water flea? It's a good question, it's not a false slide. I intended it because I want to illustrate what a hypercycle is. You all know what cycles are, and if you ignore the little blue arrows, what you see is a cycle. The fish are eaten by the herons, the Daphnia water fleas on the left are eaten by the fish, and then the algae at the bottom are eaten by the water fleas, and then the water fleas, uh, sorry, the algae at the bottom actually eat the nitrogenous waste that the herons produce. Normally, these cycles are fairly smooth. And over the course of a summer, the populations stay relatively stable. But occasionally, you will see a pond that is literally bubbling with sticklebacks, the fish at the top. And if you investigate that pond, you'll notice that the populations of all four of those creatures have exploded. So why does this happen? Well, it happens because each of those creatures is themselves a cycle. That's what the little blue arrows are. So herons make more herons, algae make more algae, Water fleas make more water fleas, and fish make more fish. And because it's a cycle of cycles, there is the possibility of explosive growth because each of the creatures in the cycle is themselves a replicator. So if we shift this over to the context of innovation, ideas are replicators. Ideas make more ideas. The more ideas that are out there, the more possible new ideas can arise. These ideas can be applied, and applications themselves can beget new applications. Fire may first have been a way to warm our hands, and then we realized it was good for cooking, good for light at night, and even good as a weapon. So applications can also reproduce. Welfare, by which I mean human well-being and also wealth in a more prosaic sense, can produce more of itself as well. Take wealth. You can reinvest wealth, and wealth makes more wealth. Now, if some of this wealth is reinvested into talent through education or skills training, you can grow the talent pool. And one of the amazing things about training teachers is that teachers can then train more teachers. So the talent portion of the hypercycle also can reproduce itself. And I'm sure you're with me, more talent, more potential ideas, and the cycle continues around. So explosive growth is possible in an innovation hypercycle. There are certain factors that can promote explosive hypercyclical growth. One is open-mindedness, and what I mean by this is an attitude of exploration, of inquiry, the ability to look at the world and be willing to accept the unexpected. Now, open-mindedness can affect an innovation hypercycle in several places, but one place, for example, is taking ideas and actually applying them and making products and processes. Some people oppose this for, in many cases, great reasons. Other people are gung-ho to do it, but the more a society is open-minded or an institution is open-minded, the more likely the hypercycle will continue to roll and to grow. Now, the opposite is closed-mindedness. There are institutions and places and countries that are not comfortable with inquiry, not comfortable with new ideas, not comfortable with the unexpected. And at various places in the hypercycle, that can short circuit the explosive growth of technology. Contestability is a related concept. It's the idea that a notion or a concept which has been accepted for 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 years is open to reinterpretation. It's open to challenge. It's open to being overturned. 
Now, that's actually quite rare in human history, but contestability is very, very important to innovation hypercycles, both going from the talent to the ideas portion and the ideas portion to the applications portion. Now, orthodoxy, I see, is the opposite. Orthodoxy is the acceptance of the way we've done things without question. And in fact, sometimes if one questions an orthodox assumption, one can be penalized. This can short circuit the innovation hypercycle in a number of different ways. One way is talent can do a lot of things. One of the things they could do is think about new ideas, but if new ideas are greeted with contempt or even punishment, why bother? Do something else. Also applying ideas to applications. There may be penalties for doing things because it challenges some accepted, received truth. So orthodoxy can lead to short circuits in the innovation hypercycle. Education and training, I think this is probably one of the easiest factors to understand. The more education there is, the more training there is, the larger the talent pool, the more willing we are to increase the knowledge and the skills of our population, the more likely that we can foster an innovation hypercycle. Now, ignorance I see is the opposite. There have been places in history and places in the world where not educating people has been the norm. And in fact, actively not educating a portion of the population is sometimes a political or social strategy. This is a great way to short circuit an innovation hypercycle. Intellectual property seems like an obvious way to promote an innovation hypercycle. I'll give an example. If you have a great idea, you may need to attract funding to turn that great idea into some sort of great application. Not everybody has those resources. So you have to convince someone to invest the capital. Well, intellectual property allows a limited time monopoly, which doesn't assure profits, but increases the chances that if you invest in the idea and turn it into an application, you might be able to profit from that investment. So more ideas get turned into applications. So intellectual property seems like it might be a driver, but I want to caution you because if applied badly or if applied too stringently, intellectual property could actually be a short circuit in the innovation hypercycle. I'll give you a, another example of trade secrets. If there are very, very stringent and strict trade secrecy laws that prevent workers who have achieved a level of expertise in some field from going to another company for a promotion, for example, and bringing that information with them, then you're gonna prevent the talent from either thinking or sharing the ideas. Too many patents can also produce what's called a patent thicket and make it very difficult for anybody to invest in a product because they're worried a lot of patent holders will come out of the woodwork and accuse them of infringement. So intellectual property is interesting, it turns out, because it can both promote or short circuit the innovation hypercycle. Regulation more generally is like intellectual property. You can imagine ways in which Enlightened regulation could promote an innovation hypercycle. Investment, for example, in education and training by a government. That would be a great way to grow the talent pool. Uh, maybe providing seed funding for inventors so that they could try out their ideas as applications without mortgaging their, their houses. So regulation, when done wisely and when done right, I think, can promote an innovation hypercycle but you can, I'm sure, imagine situations in which regulation thwarts it, short circuits it. Imagine if a government, for example, decided that a particular new technology was doing so well that it could suck up gigantic amounts of taxation from that one technology. Let's say electric cars, 50% tax on all electric cars. Well, fewer people are gonna make electric cars, fewer people are gonna drive electric cars to avoid the tax. So regulation, just like intellectual property, it's a double-edged sword. It can promote innovation, and it could potentially short-circuit an innovation hypercycle. Now, I'd like to offer a few examples of particular instances of innovation hypercycles. One of my favorites is the School of Alexandria in ancient Egypt. The Ptolemies, 
who ran Egypt about 2,000 years ago, decided that they wanted all the knowledge in the world to be assembled in the library of Alexandria. So they took strong steps to make sure this was true. For example, if you sailed your boat into the harbor at Alexandria, you would be searched, not for contraband, not for drugs, not for smuggled goods, but for books and scrolls. And those books and scrolls would be taken from you, they would be copied, and copies would be put in the library of Alexandria, available to all. The books and scrolls would be returned, don't worry. But the idea was that information in the rest of the world would come to Alexandria and then be assembled together in a library. So this really promoted the ideas part of the innovation hypercycle. Now, interestingly, the School of Alexandria produced amazing inventions as well, including the clepsydra, which was the most accurate clock until about 200 years ago. It was a water clock that was incredibly good at telling time. And the aeolipile, which was a primitive version of the steam engine. The Industrial Revolution, especially in Britain, is another great example. And what I want to focus in on there is the cooperation, collaboration, and competition between a number of very, very smart and um, enthusiastic and hardworking people, including, for example, Black, who essentially invented modern chemistry, used it to color textiles, Hargreaves, who made the spinning jenny, um, Hume, who promoted an empirical approach to the world, actually looking at how things work, not assuming that Aristotle was right, Adam Smith, who came up with a modern view of economics that really helped people understand how investment and entrepreneurship worked, and Watt, who came up with the first practical steam engine, which was applied to just about every project you could imagine that required power, and countless other people who contributed to the Industrial Revolution. Now, one of the amazing things about the early British Industrial Revolution is that all of these folks and others besides formed little discussion clubs, like the Select Club or the Poker Club, both of which were formed in Edinburgh. These clubs would form and reform and people would get angry at each other and they'd split off. But the idea was at least once a week you'd get together with some good whiskey and you would discuss the ideas of the day and you would contest them, you would debate them, and then you would take those ideas home into your workshop and try and produce some sort of application that you could turn into some wealth for yourself. The Cavendish Laboratory is another example. It is a laboratory that exists today at University of Cambridge in England. It was set up to make a mark in the world of physics for Cambridge, which up until that time worried that it was falling behind Oxford and maybe American universities and Canadian universities as well. So the Cavendish Laboratory was set up with a new sort of philosophy, an open philosophy, a philosophy that allowed its members, its scholars, a tremendous amount of flexibility in what they wanted to study. Now, a confused visiting scholar who wandered the laboratories and saw the diversity of science that was going on once asked the director, what the heck is physics at the Cavendish Laboratory? And the director said, well, physics is what physicists do. Now, as a consequence of this flexible approach to research, which involved, by the way, the ability of even undergraduates to wander through the laboratories and question famous scientists about whether the valve should be open or shut on their experimental apparatus. The Cavendish Laboratory has won 30 Nobel Prizes. If it were a country, it would be seventh in the world. Silicon Valley, I don't need to tell you very much about it. It affects many aspects of our lives in both positive and negative ways. But through the transistor, the microchip, and the software that is currently eating the world, Silicon Valley is a thriving innovation hypercycle. The Broad Institute I will offer as a personal favorite of mine. It's a very new institution that was set up by MIT, Harvard, and some teaching hospitals in Boston. And its mission is to cure all genetic disease. And what they've done is assembled a tremendous cast of brilliant biomedical scientists from around the world. They've achieved the status of the number one scientific institution in the world. And one example of what they're doing is driving forward genome editing, from CRISPR-Cas9 that you might have heard of, to base editing, to prime editing, and then translating that science into products, applications, 
and ultimately increases in human welfare. So I want to finish with a few insights that I'll offer you. Innovation hypercycles create technology hotspots. They generate new technologies in an explosive fashion, but they're rare, and they're temporary, and they're ever so fragile, and they're very difficult to sustain. Some factors have strong effects, open-mindedness, closed-mindedness, education. Other factors are more difficult to understand, intellectual property, regulation. But in my opinion, nurturing, in, uh, hyper, nurturing innovation hypercycles wisely will generate tremendous benefits for humanity. Thank you very much.